All right. Oh, no, don't worry. This actually is just my first slide. <laughs> Hi. I'm Sean. Uh, among other things, I am a member of the Crates.io team. A uh, thing that I've been realizing today is that a lot of times I will say something intending it to be presented as my personal opinion, and folks have been interpreting it as an official statement coming from the team. And I'm going to be doing both in this talk. So to help clarify things, this is my team hat. I'm going to remind every time I change it, but if, if the hat is on, I am talking as a member of the Crates.io team. And if I'm not wearing the hat, I am talking about my own personal opinions that do not necessarily reflect the rest of the team. Now, I know this is a Rust conference, but uh, this talk is going to have a lot of Ruby in it, because the other project I'm best known for is Ruby on Rails. <laughs> I love this picture so much. So the Crates.io team is very new. So first, I want to talk about what the, what the team is and what our responsibilities are. Uh, we have two main responsibilities. The first is that we manage the day-to-day -day operations of Crates.io. We respond to incidents. We keep everything running. The second responsibility we have is to set the development priorities for the project. And we're usually doing this based on the challenges that we're currently facing on the operations side. The team was started this year in April. Uh, we started with just three people, but we've grown quite a bit since then. We now have nine. Everyone on the team is here for different reasons. Some of us work on operations. Some of us work on code. Some people are here just to increase the communication between the Crates.io team and other teams. One thing we all agree on, though, is how important Crates.io is to the Rust ecosystem. Now, you might be wondering, why does Crates.io need an official team? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. In the past, it's been unclear what the role of Crates.io is in relation to the Rust project. The RFC's repo for Rust lays out what needs an RFC, but how much of that applies to Crates.io? Do it, does a new feature for Crates.io require a feature? It does in the compiler, but, and uh, we didn't have separate policies. If somebody opened an RFC about Crates.io, who would be the team that actually made the final decision on that? Establishing an official team only responsible for Crates.io provides a lot of clear answers to these questions, or at least an avenue to do so. It's also an effort to recruit more people to work on the project. The team was started this year when it became clear that we needed more people working. A bug had made it into production, and nobody with the ability to deploy the site had the bandwidth to deal with it. So Ashley Williams and I formed the team in order to deal with that bug and some of the other operational problems that we had at the time. We're going to talk about some of those problems, but first I want to talk about some of the results we've had, because it's been a really exciting year for Grace.io. The first one is that the site is faster. Did anybody try using Crates.io like March, early April? It was really bad. So we've spent a lot of time and effort improving that uh, throughout the year. These are, these are some of our stats. I just took this screenshot today. So our 95th percentile times are consistently staying under 100 millisecond. Uh, 100, 100 milliseconds, and our 99th are consistently staying under 150. That means that 99% of requests coming into Crates.io get their response in less than 150 milliseconds. And this is huge for us, because at the start of the year, these numbers were both frequently multiple seconds. One of the other big things that we've done, and probably the most important thing we've done, is that we have an on-call rotation now. Uh, if the site goes down at 3 in the morning, somebody's actually getting woken up to deal with it. Uh, we set up so some basic monitoring. We're not monitoring everything that we want to yet, but some of the big ones, like is the site returning an error for everybody, or uh, are response times obnoxiously high, wake us up in the middle of the night. And a lot of incidents have occurred over the last year. And when they have, we've been able to consistently respond in a, <clears throat> in a timely fashion 24 hours a day. Now, of course, there's a, oh. <coughs> now, of course, there's sort of a golden rule in operations. When you start monitoring something that didn't previously have monitoring, you're inevitably going to learn it's broken. <laughs> So when we first set up uh, PagerDuty, I was the person who was on call for that, for that rotation. So I got woken up in the middle of the night a lot. 
This is uh, April 12th is when we, or April 13th is when we first introduced monitoring to crates.io and every single night for three nights, I got woken up at, after midnight. Thank you. So I wanna talk about uh, what caused some of these and how we've corrected them because a few of them were rather interesting. So the first incident was really bad. Uh, requests to the crate download endpoint were timing out. And we take this sort of incident more seriously than any other because if the crate download endpoint isn't working, that means that cargo build is broken for some people's projects, and that is just unacceptable. We were randomly sometimes taking more than 30 seconds to respond on this endpoint, which normally responds in under eight milliseconds. Now, we're hosted on Heroku, which means we have a hard upper limit on our response time. If we don't send a response to the user, or at least start sending a response to the, to the user within 30 seconds, the request is killed, and we have no control over that. We cannot increase it any further, and we really don't want to. So the endpoint is really simple. We grab a database connection. We increment a counter to, uh, to mark that the crate has been downloaded one more time. And then we redirect you to S3. Now, redirecting you to S3 can't possibly be the cause of the timeout, since that's literally us just saying, cool, now go to this other uh, URL. So the, uh, the thing that was timing out had to either be a, uh, grabbing a database connection or the actual query that we were running. The problem was both of these actions had a timeout of greater than 30 seconds, so we really didn't have a way to figure out which of those it was. If, uh, if, one was if either one failed, it would fail after the request already got killed. Now, the other problem was it, the, it's a very simple code change to lower those timeouts, but that required deploying new code. And uh, the Rust compiler isn't necessarily always the fastest. Um, <laughs> our build is actually a lot slower than we'd like, and we're, we're figuring out why and tr trying to improve that. But at best, it takes about maybe five minutes and at, uh, for a, a release build. And at worst, it can take upwards of 30 minutes, which if the site's down, not, that's not really the feedback cycle you want to have. So one of the things that we've been doing to improve our ability to respond to incidents like this is making more things configurable by environment variables. Anything we might want to change on the fly, we uh, configure with an environment variable rather than a magic number in code. This is best practice anyway, but it, it wasn't done already, and now it is. Uh, this it's very easy for us to just change an environment variable and restart the server, and it's much faster than actually deploying new code. So once we did this, uh, we set the timeouts for both to 10 seconds, and we established, yep, the database connection is coming in fine, so the problem is that the query itself is timing out. So we need to figure out why, why is this query now, which we expect to finish almost immediately, ta sometimes taking upwards of 30 seconds. So we're hosted on Heroku. We use Heroku Postgres for our database. They have some really, really great dashboards for this. They have this view where you can see all of your most time-consuming queries and a graph over time of how uh, many times they're executed per second and also how long those queries take. Now, the query that we were executing uh, inside the crate download endpoint had a ton of variability in it. Sometimes it was taking one millisecond on average. Sometimes it was taking 150 milliseconds on average. The average never went up to 30 seconds because it was just a few outliers, not like every request. Because it was so variable, I suspected that it was a uh, lock contention issue. Basically, some other database connection somewhere was trying to update the same row, locking it to do that, and then doing a bunch of other work, which apparently takes more than 30 seconds before it let go and our download can continue. As I was digging through the logs to try and find more information on this, I actually found out that Heroku just logs for you anytime a query is waiting on a lock for more than a second, and we had a lot of those logs. so. We have a lock contention issue, yay. <laughs> so because we know that's, that something else is locking the row, that means there's somewhere else in our code that is updating the same table. So we need to figure out where that was. Didn't have any fancy graphs this time. It was actually a really blunt instrument. I grepped the code base for the table name and looked at like the five other places that were touching it, because uh, the, the table is called version downloads. It's how many times has this version of this crate been downloaded on this date? Uh, and just not a lot of things need to, t need to talk to that table. So uh, we narrowed it down pretty quickly to the update downloads binary that we have running constantly in the background. And what this does is every few minutes, it'll go and look at the uh, version downloads table. So that's our most granular view uh, of, of how often a crate is downloaded. 
and that just updates a bunch of other caches. Like we can calculate the number of uh, downloads that have happened across all crates across all time just from this table, but that would be obnoxiously slow. So we don't do that. We just have a separate place that we store that along with uh, how many times was this crate downloaded instead of just this version per day, and then version all time, crate all time, et cetera, et cetera, lots of different things. So what this does is this goes through the version download rows, and it grabs them in batches of 1,000, and then starts processing each one. Uh, the first thing it does is update the, the row and say, like, yeah, we've counted more downloads from here. The problem was each batch of 1,000 was um, being processed in a single database transaction. So any locks it held were going to be held until, until that transaction committed. So the first row that we processed in that batch would remain locked while we processed the remaining 999 rows in that batch. And uh, this, uh, this binary also logged every time it started a new batch so we could see how long each batch was taking. Looking at the logs, it took just over 30 seconds. <laughs> Bingo. So this is the actual query that we execute in update uh, in the download endpoint. You don't actually need to, to see it, but this is the actual graph from when we, when we deployed this fix. The fix was actually really easy. We just changed it to hold a transaction for one row instead of every 1,000 rows, and the lock gets released immediately. And as soon as we deployed that, the lock contention issue went away. And uh, what used to take upwards of 30 seconds sometimes, but the max average we have here is 152, and it went to sub-millisecond, which is what we expected to see. Now the other question though is why was the update download script taking 30 seconds for every batch? We didn't used to have this issue and it just had recently started. So the problem here was that uh, we were just missing some database indexes, some caches on your database that make it easier to do things like sort by individual columns. And our table had grown to a critical mass of size where a different index it used to be using could no longer be used. So this meant that, the, uh, that every query on this table had to scan the entire, the entire table row by row and do every, all of its operations in memory. And this meant that a query that used to be taking a handful of milliseconds uh, now was taking 14 seconds on average. This one was luckily also fairly easy to fix. Do, did some tuning, added some, added some indexes, and we went from 14, mil, uh, 14 seconds to 2 milliseconds. A <laughs> little, little bit of a substantial change. Uh, and at this point, the issue was fixed, which was good, because it was 3 AM, and I wanted to go back to sleep. <laughs> now, at this point, we didn't have requests timing out anymore. But we still had performance problems. Everything was not fine. We were getting reports that sometimes crates.io was taking as long as six seconds to load. And this wasn't an isolated problem. Everybody could reproduce it. It was intermittent, and we initially thought it was isolated because we tried to uh, verify the report like a few hours later, and it was, I don't want to say fine, but faster. Um, but everybody eventually was able, we, we all realized, oh, there's something funky going on here. And one of the metrics that we get paged on is when response times get, to, uh, get too high. So inevitably, I got paged. Oh. Wah. This is Ruby when she's like 30 seconds old. It's great. I love how, I love how newborns just look like little old men. <laughs> um, so the home page was one of the slow endpoints. The other one was our crate search page, which, both show, which is the name of the endpoint that you hit both when you actually are searching or if you just click the view all crates button. It's still, we just hit the same endpoint. Um, so we started looking for traffic pack Because we knew it was intermittent, that gave us some specific times to start looking at in the logs. And so we started looking for traffic patterns around the times that things slowed down. And it turned out that the problem was bots. <laughs> Thanks, Arshia. Uh, what was happening was we had more and more crawlers that were coming and just trying to get all of our information on all of our crates. And that's fine, like you can come do that, but you gotta be well behaved. And these were not being well behaved. They were doing things like sending us five concurrent requests uh, as quickly as we, as we could possibly respond to our slowest endpoint on the app in a loop. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know that feeling when you're just sitting there and you're trying to eat your chicken nuggets and these creepy fuzzy giants just keep coming up and asking for a hug and they won't stop coming and you just can't handle all this right now so you start throwing your chicken nuggets on the floor? Yeah, that was us with bots. 
Also, I'm sorry, your requests are not chicken nuggets, but they kind of are. <laughs> now, we actually could have solved this one really, really easily. Uh, the simplest solution would have been just to upgrade our database server. Uh, right now, we run on the cheapest production tier database that Heroku has to offer. So there's a lot of room for us to scale vertically there. And we just could have handled this increased traffic if we just had a slightly beefier database server. But we uh, have avoided doing that for as long as possible uh, because it's forcing us to deal with a lot of issues that we will eventually have to deal with a little bit sooner. The one specifically that we wanted this to force us to deal with was writing a crawler policy, which we didn't have at the time. And well, we still don't, but we've, we will soon, I promise. We need to. Um, we also didn't have anything in place to actually block the misbehaving bots, which if, the, if these bots weren't just misbehaving but were actively malicious was something that we really, really would have needed. So th that was our main solution here was to first just give us a mechanism to start blocking them, um, both by IP address and by user agent. And we saw our database uh, load go from, well, double what our database can handle <laughs> back down to near zero, which is sort of what we expect. It, it never really gets above like 10% these days. And the site started feeling more responsive. Not, not great, but not six seconds. So that was the big, big problem. But there's still the problem of like, why, why were these bots giving us so much load just from hitting these endpoints in the first place? These still felt like they were a lot slower than they should. Just listing all of the crates uh, and paginating it shouldn't take that long. Well, it turned out the problem was calculating the recent downloads number, the number of downloads that a crate has had in the last 90 days. Uh, we were doing this like just the simplest way you could. You join, you join to this other table, you, you group it down, and you sum up the results. And like, it was fine. It, it, the query took about 500 milliseconds, which, I mean, it's not unreasonable for what it was doing, but it was making the site feel sluggish. So this, uh, for this, we decided to create a materialized view, which is basically just another form of cache that you can have in the database, and you can create indexes on that. So basically, it's, it was just a way for us to occasionally pre-calculate the recent uh, downloads for every crate, and then we can just get information from this cache table much more frequently. The downside here is that the um, that, that uh, cache only gets updated about every, once every five minutes. So like when you see recent downloads, it's not actually including all of the downloads you just sent in the last five minutes, but who cares? Um, <laughs> Once we did that, that brought us, there was more work that we've done since then, but that more or less, those were the big, big wins, and that got us mostly to the performance we have today. Uh, that last commit there is when we deployed the materialized view change. Um, and, and this is where we got to about 250 milliseconds for most requests, which was pretty good. So these are two examples of the um, performance work that we've been doing and the kind of incidents that we typically deal with. There's been a lot more work we've done on the performance. We've gotten our response times down by half from this point. And there have been a lot of other incidents, which are super interesting. And I would love to tell you about all of them, but we just don't have time today. But this is a little window into, what, into some of what we've been working on. Now, I want to talk about what we're planning on in the future for the next year. This isn't everything we want to do, but these are some of the things that I'm most excited about. So first thing I want to do is fix crate uploads. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, but wait, crate uploads aren't broken. I just uploaded crate. No, it's, trust me, it, it kind of is broken. <laughs> um, so the way this works is you upload your tar file to our server. We then upload that tar file up to S3. Then we update the database. Then we also have to go update the index, which is, the, which is basically a GitHub repo that has information that's easier for Cargo to digest. And we do all of that, and then we're like, cool, you uploaded your crate. And this is great because it means if any of this is going to fail, we can tell you very quickly. But it's really, really bad because GitHub can have like network issues or um, the power can go out in between the GitHub um, index getting updated and the database transaction committing, which then means that your crate exists in the index, but it doesn't exist in our database. And that can lead to really bad things happening. And we have no mechanism to like redo that later. And when we have the, file, the files going through our server before they get to S3, that's fine, but we have that hard 30 second limit on how long we can take. And that means that there's a hard upper limit on how big your crate can be or how slow your network connection can be before you just can't upload your crate. There was a person uh, who was like this, the same IP address trying to upload a crate and it was timing out. And like for a week they tried every day and their, their, their network was just too slow for them to be able to do it. And I wanted to treat like, can whoever's at this IP email us? Because we can like help, but. Um, 
So what I want to do is, for, is two changes, one of which is almost done. Uh, the, the first is uh, the updates to GitHub. I want to move those off the web server. So when you upload your crate, when, we, when you do cargo publish and that returns, you actually won't be able to immediately uh, refer to it in your cargo.toml. You will basically almost immediately. Like it, for, for the normal case, it shouldn't be noticeable. But what we'll do is we'll just update, uh, we'll, we'll put this into a background queue and we can retry this as many times as we want later on. The other thing I want to do is have Cargo handle the S3 upload. So you can take as long as you want uploading that file to S3, and only when that's done do you come to us. The next thing I want to do is load testing. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, later on about some of the, the scales that I think we um, will reach with our current setup. But this is all based on some very, very preliminary ad hoc load testing. I want to guess. Uh, I want us to use a proper service for this, and I also want to know if we don't change a line of code but we get the beefiest database server we can possibly get on Heroku and buy as many web dynos as we feel like we need and not like actually buy them for a month but have them up for 10 minutes for testing. What is the max scale we can reach before we actually have to start changing code? I also want us to be monitoring more things. Right now, we're getting paged on the most important critical items, but there are a lot of things that we just don't get informed about if they break. There are a couple of times that I've broken crate uploads in one way or another. And if it's specifically crate uploads that I break, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't people aren't uploading crates frequently enough for that to, to trigger any alarms. On average, we get about one crate every five minutes, and we don't really alert unless our error rate is above 1% for all requests for five minutes. <coughs> one of the problems with growing uh, our operations team is that the credentials that you need to manage the site also give you access to a lot of things you don't necessarily need access to. This isn't like a question of trust. It's just generally not good policy to give people keys to things they don't need because they don't need them. So uh, one of the ways that we're going to, to fix this is just by creating some bots. And the bots are able to manage the site. And we can give people the ability to give commands to the bots. This will give us a lot more granular control over what permissions each individual contributor has. And this is also really amusing because this year, bots were our problem, and next year, bots are the solution. <laughs> uh, we're also going to be looking at redesigning the site. The main rustling.org site is going to be getting a redesign as part of Rust 2018, and we're looking at it, whether we want crates.io to be part of that. We're also discussing, while we're redesigning the site, if it makes sense for us to switch off of our single page web app and um, be serving static server rendered HTML instead. All right, I'm gonna take my, I'm gonna take my, project, my project hat off. Everything I say from this point on is just me talking as me and not, I'm not trying to represent the team right now. Crates.io has been a very different pro kind of project for me. Uh, I've been working in open source for a long time, but this project is just a, an entirely different experience. It's the first open source project I've worked on where my primary contribution is operations and not code. It's also the first Rust web application I've, I've worked on. You'll notice that every problem I described today was solved by tweaking the database and not our code. This is an application that is really, truly database bound. I've built a lot of web apps over the years, and this is the first time I've ever really been able to say that. The amount of time we're spending in our web servers is virtually zero. There's no garbage collector to tune. There's no unreasonable memory growth or hard to debug memory leaks. And the amount of performance we've been able to achieve with virtually zero caching in front of our servers is astonishing. And we're using diesel, which I'm biased on, but like, <laughs> We get to take advantage of a lot of, our, a lot of the really advanced features of Postgres, and we don't have to give up type safety to do that. And that means that we can squeeze a lot more performance out of our little database server. If there's one thing that being on the crates.io team, if there's one thing that being on the crates.io team has done for me, it's making me really excited about the future of Rust on the web. People aren't kidding when they say Rust gives you superpowers. <laughs> No, seriously, we spend more money on log storage than all of our servers combined. We can process so many requests, we have to spend more to store the logs from those requests than it costs us to actually process them. It's insane. <laughs> this 
project has also really taught me the value of keeping your stack simple, at least early on. Right now, our operations bandwidth is very low. There are only a handful of us working on it, uh, and each of us only has a little bit of time. Because of this, we've been trying to keep our stack as simple as possible for as long as possible. If you want to get, uh, if you want to get involved with crates.io right now, you have to learn our web server, you have to learn Postgres, and that's it. And I'd like, to keep, I'd like to keep it that way for as long as we possibly can. It limits the number of technologies you have to learn. It also limits the number of things that we have to worry about how to scale or how to keep online. And when things go wrong, we have very strong tooling right now that can help us diagnose the problem quickly that we're familiar with. And adding new, adding new services into the mix means that we're going to have new tools that we have to learn to diagnose things when everything goes wrong. And things will eventually go wrong, as they always do. Now, this is good advice for any startup. And kind of this, Crates.io is very analogous to like a, a, a early post-launch startup at this point. Um, but basically, prioritize, prioritizing things in terms of keeping our stack simple means that we're doing a lot of things wrong for whatever value of wrong uh, you want to use. Like, I'm sure when I explained how we count downloads, some of you were horrified because it's not going to scale. And that's true. Download counting is for sure going to be our largest bottleneck going forward. Like, we know that. But we're, all, we're also uh, pretty sure that we can grow about an order of magnitude more traffic before we even have to worry about just upgrading our database server. And I think we've got about two orders of magnitude, uh, or maybe three, after that before we get to the point where we actually have to start changing our approach and can't just throw a bigger server at the problem. Things are a little different when you're building an open source service instead of open source software. Your priorities have to change. There's a lot of people who want to crawl crates.io, and they're building all sorts of cool things with the data that they're getting from their crawlers. And I really want to be able to like, just let them hit us as fast as they can and give them all their information and see the cool things they build. The problem is, if we do that, then we have to upgrade our servers and buy more servers. And that costs actual money. It's just not a thing that you worry about in, in when I'm building diesel, for example. It's like to do what, to, to do what uh, our users want, it's just more time, but it's not, it's not actually going to cost more actual money from somebody. And a lot of the things that we have to deal with require actual lawyers, too. And uh, as far as I'm aware, nobody on the team has passed the bar. Uh, Ashley, Steve, Justin, have any of you passed the bar like in the last hour or two? No? OK, yeah, no. As far as I know, nobody's a, nobody's a lawyer. When people come to an open source project, most people are expecting to contribute some code or write some docs or open issues. But when you, what you need to grow are things like, hey, can you come join our on-call rotation? Uh, it's a little bit harder to make that work. This morning, Nico and Ashley talked a lot about how open source by serendipity doesn't always work. People don't just always pop out of the blue with the pull request. Definitely nobody's popping out of the blue like, hey, yeah, I would totally love to get paged at 3 AM if your site is down. Yeah. One thing that's really different about working on an open source service is how you have to measure your interactions with people. If people disagree with something that you say, or something that you do, or something that you don't do, there's a lot more vectors for them to actively attack you. Unfortunately, we got to learn that firsthand earlier this week. Uh, on Monday afternoon, while I was working on this talk, actually, <laughs> I didn't get to work on my talk that afternoon because um, Somebody had decided to create a bot, uh, registered a user called Crates.io, and was registering as many crates as they could, as fast as they could, with an empty readme just saying, if you want this crate, please open an issue on our issue tracker linking to the official Crates.io issue tracker. Uh, we think, we, we can't read minds, but we think that this person was doing this uh, to make a point. Uh, there's been an escalating discussion around our, squatting our name squatting policy. And the thread's gotten very intense. Um, it takes a lot of energy to, to spend time even just reading it, much less responding. And so I, I know I personally have just been trying to like keep my distance a little bit until things simmer down. And that's how I've always dealt with uh, open source. When things got hostile, I just sort of backed away from it. And that's just not an option here, because, if you, it, because people can just come and try and take the site down if they don't like what you're doing. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion 
this is, I, this, it, it, it's a little uh, frustrating to talk about because I know that most likely nobody in this room is the kind of people I'm talking about. I know that it's a handful of very hostile or angry people, but they t end up just taking up an obnoxiously large percentage of your time and energy. And, it's, and from a maintainer's point of view, it very quickly feels like that's, those are the only conversations that you're having. And one of the frustrations people have been expressing is that we haven't been listening or haven't been responding, which there's some truth to that. And we probably should have maybe not replied to these threads directly, but made a, an official blog post reminding people that we are watching the conversation and just, if nothing else, restating, like, here's our rationale. But we have a process in Rust to, to make po changes in policy happen. If you want, you can start an internal thread to kind of come to a consensus on what you want to change. And then if you want, you can open an internal thread with a pre-RFC to get feedback on a hypothetical RFC that you want to open. And sometimes team members will jump in and get involved in those, but they're not obligated to. The place where we have to give a, a response and where the real discussion happens, where the change happens, is when people open an RFC. So there's been a lot of frustration that I've been seeing from people that this internal thread got opened up and then we just didn't reply. When we never got, or we didn't, it was more that we didn't take action from just this internal thread, but we never got an RFC. That needs to happen before policies can change. And it's so frustrating just as a, as a maintainer to have people get angry then you don't respond. And then when you do respond, they think that you're talking on behalf of the team. And I happen to disagree with some of the opinions that these people have, but they are assuming I'm speaking on behalf of everyone on the team, so they think I'm then shutting the, the conversation down, so now they're mad, they're mad because I did respond. All of this to say is just, discussions are hard, and open source is hard, and I may seem tired this week, and it's because I am. It's been, a, it's been a really rough personal week for me, and this is, this is not the fault of anybody in this room, but it's just something I wanted, I wanted to share. Now, we do actually communicate in a lot of channels. Um, one of the things that I'm trying to be careful about is we're trying to now much more publicly say, hey, crates the crates.io team is a thing now, and we've got a lot of people, and like, there's a lot of ways we want to communicate. We have to be careful with the messaging that we're using because it's very easy when I say things like an RFC needs to be opened, it's very easy for me to sound like I'm accusing the people who didn't open an RFC of not doing that. When in, that, in all of these cases, I think it's very, very reasonable for the, person, for the people involved to have just not known that was even an option. And especially for all of these, which I don't think we've ever talked publicly about, uh, there's really not a, a lot of reason that you would know about these, but we're gonna start publicizing them a lot because we want people to get more involved. So if you wanna know like what's going on with crates.io, sometimes, we'll uh, sometimes we'll tweet features from here. Sometimes we will, well, we will always tweet when we have an incident from here, but uh, crates.io status, you can follow it and you'll get a tweet if we are down and not up. Um, we also have a status page that you can check out where a lot of that information goes as well. Um, a lot of folks, uh, the, the incident that happened on Monday uh, got emailed to the Rust moderation team, which is fine, like that's a perfectly fine thing to do, but we are wondering if we need to uh, also be making it, making, helping folks know that we have our own email addresses. Uh, so help at crates.io will get you in touch with the team. We also have a Discord channel on the, is it official or is it un still unofficial? The Rust Discord? <laughs> okay, the official unofficial Rust Discord. We have a channel, crates I, uh, it's just crates-io. And also, like, if you want a response from us, you can open an RFC and we'll respond. <laughs> and you should come get involved. Uh, anybody can, is free to come join our weekly team meetings as an observer. Uh, they take place every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. They happen in, um, normally they happen by t uh, text in our Discord channel. Anybody can come to that. Uh, once a month, we will do them by video. Um, you'll need an invite if you want to come to that. But if you just reach out to us, we're happy, we're happy to invite you. Uh, that's a great way to get started if you're interested in joining the team. One thing that we really, really want to grow that's super low effort, if you are awake during hours that not, that not a lot of members of the team are, we want to have an email address that more people know that just page an on-call person so that if somebody reports something in our Discord channel that we're not already monitoring, a human being can make the call like, is this worth waking somebody up, yes or no, and then wake us up. So if that's something you are interested in doing, 
uh, come get in touch with us. Um, I want to just thank a couple of people before I go. Um, Steve and Ashley are the two people who did the incident response with me this week. And like I said, it's for me personally been a very rough week. And how professional and talented they are has really helped get me through it. Um, so I want to thank them and Josh Triplett, who helped us with the retro and the incident report. Um, I also uh, want, to, want to thank my company for both letting me take the time to come here, but uh, part of the reason we were able to get the retro and the shepherding on the incident done so quickly is because I'm privileged enough to work for a company where I could tell my boss, like, hey, Crates.io is under attack, and I think this is going to take most of my time, so I need to take the rest of the week off. And they're like, sure, OK. So like, <laughs> thank you, Shopify, for that. Uh, uh, if you want to come ask me questions or just talk to me, please come do after afterwards out in the hallway. Um, I've got these stickers. This is, this is Ruby's official sticker. I would love for you to have one. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me personally, this is where you can do so. Uh, that's all I've got. Thank you very much.